welcome everybody to Webinar Wednesday. My name is Jeremy Gallagher, um, one of the solution architects here at Syrian Networks, focusing on security. So today we wanted to talk about the proof of value that Cisco offers with uh, ASA and SourceFire and Firepower Services, and you know, kind of the overall value, what it's going to bring, what it does and doesn't do. Um, I think there's some confusion on that, um, try and clarify some of that, and go through the architectures so that um, I think everyone understands what it is we're trying to accomplish um, from an architecture perspective on the network. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple things on uh, Firesight Management Center, the uh, kind of what the value is, what it's looking for, what it can and can't see, just real high level, I'm not going to dig into it too much, and then we'll uh, Talk about AMP for endpoints. Um, again, pretty high level, just what it is and um, what it will add to uh, security. Uh, AMP for endpoints is a different proof of value. Sometimes we put them in place to try and figure out what's going on on a particular network, but it's not technically part of the Firepower Services proof of value. So, uh, with that, um, <clears throat> what I'm currently sharing is the Serium Networks document for the uh, Cisco proof of value. And I just want to go through that um, so that there's some clarity on uh, what we're trying to provide. So the uh, proof of value is, is a two week engagement once it's installed. Um, so we try and engage early and get all of the information um, that we need from the customer. Um, IP addresses, DNS, um, NTP, those different criteria. So that what we do is we build them uh, on our desk at Sirium, get them set up and tested, uh, and then we'll send them out and, and get them installed. Um, usually goes pretty smooth. Sometimes there's a couple of hiccups, but we can talk about that. I think it's part of the architecture. So again, it's two-week engagement. Once it's installed, um, We'll do some follow-ups. We'll do it immediately as soon as it's up and running. We'll try and look at the data, make sure it's getting good data, see if there's anything that jumps out at anybody, and give a quick tutorial on the um, Firesight Management Center so that for the two weeks the customer has the proof of value, they also have access to their Fire Ma Firesight Management Center. Um, they can take a look at it, get used to it. Um, I think that's the best value that you get is essentially it's a two-week test drive of the system and you get to look at a lot of the data on your network. So what we do is, like I said, we do the immediate follow-up uh, once it's installed to help give a quick walkthrough on how to use it. We'll do a 48-hour follow-up to make sure we're getting good data and if not, maybe we have to tweak one of the networks we're trying to discover or something that's going on there. Uh, and again, see if there's any things going on on the network that we should you should be aware of or the customer should be aware of, something we see that's um, pretty out of line. Um, and then we'll do a one-week follow-up, which is a pretty in-depth follow-up. Um, I'll usually do it and I'll bring in uh, our senior security engineer at times to drill deeper into some of the analysis, some of the packet capture analysis, some of the stuff going on, if there's some pretty in-depth stuff that uh, the customer wants to look at. Um, then once we're done with that, we'll actually generate some reports. Um, they're kind of, I wouldn't say generic because they're specific to each POV, but it's a generic template that gives a high level overview of what's going on in the network. So, and I'll, I'll show you some of those as we go through this. Excuse me. So the POV is actually meant to be a, an appliance you're putting in transparent mode. It's not going to block anything. It's not going to interrupt traffic. Um, but what it's looking at is uh, the, on the perimeter, your current perimeter solution, is it allowing things ingress and egress that you don't want on your network? Um, it's not an overall east-west look at your network. It's not going to see all of that traffic because we're really just talking about a perimeter proof of value. There are other proof of values for um, I guess east-west looking at things, uh, something like Stealth Watch and ICE and those different pieces. So uh, I just want to put that out there as a, it's a perimeter look at things. Um, it is not a security audit. Um, it's not, you can't use the reports that come out of it for compliance. 
HIPAA, PCI, NIST, any of those. So uh, want to put that out there as something to consider. Uh, excuse me. So as we go through this document, just real quick, I'm not going to bore you guys to tears with all of this, but there's some stuff that we need the customer to provide, uh, IP addresses. Um, so in the, there's two flavors um, of proof of value. And one of them is using dCloud, which is a Cisco hosted service specifically for these things. Um, and what we do is we tie the ASA and the firepower sensor into that hosted service. And we it's a 384-bit encrypted link, and it uses it sends the metadata to that Firesight Management Center that's hosted. Um, and it allows us to turn these things up uh, with a lot less pain because of licensing issues and stuff on, uh, put, instead of putting them on site. We have, have had a couple where even though they understood that it was secure and they were okay with it, they still couldn't get approval for it. So in those instances, we've actually deployed uh, an ESXi machine on on-prem running an OVA for Firesight Management Center and built it on site. So once again, we have to have all the information from the customer to apply for licensing to make that all work. Um, and then of course the IP addresses to make it all work. So there's a couple of different versions. Um, dCloud is definitely going to be the best way to do it, um, the least amount of delay and issues, but it can also be done um, completely on-prem uh, with the SXI um, laptop version. So I mentioned that because here in the um, customer requirements, if we're doing a dCloud, we only need two IP addresses, and they have to have internet access to get rule updates. Um, if we do the ESXi version, uh, we'll need four IP addresses. Uh, the two that are listed here as the source fire module and ASA management port, and then two more, one for the ESXi host, uh, and another for the fire site management center itself. So the other, uh, one of the architecture pieces is when we deploy it, we use a span port um, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with, essentially it's a monitor session on a switch, a Cisco switch, that allows you to replicate all the traffic on a particular port or VLAN or range of ports um, and mirror that traffic coming out a span port. And what we do is we take that span port, plug it into the ASA, and that's the data that gets processed. So we're not in line. There's no issues with your traffic. Um, that's just uh, the best way to do it. The other option is a, a tap, which is service affecting. You have to put it in line with the um, inside interface of the current perimeter device. And so you will experience, uh, you know, five seconds of outage while you're putting the tap in. Um, so we've done them both ways. It's, it's really up to the customer and sometimes up to the equipment they currently have, if they have a Cisco equipment or something that won't do I know some of the other ones will do what's called mirror reports and stuff, so, but it is an option. So here's a couple of reference architectures. Um, this is the dCloud version um, with a span port here off of the switch. Um, it's, it's looking at, essentially you're mirroring the port here that is the inside interface to the existing firewall. You'll span that traffic into the POV, POV ASA with source fire. Uh, it'll process everything here, apply policies. Again, they're um, not actual policies. I mean, you can set it to drop traffic. It won't do anything because traffic doesn't actually go anywhere. Um, but it'll drop and log. Um, and all of that data that's being processed will be reported up to Fireside Management Center where you can see all of that. This uh, architecture here is for a tap. You can see how it's in line. Um, so that definitely something to consider in your architecture because um, it will be disruptive. Granted, very little, five seconds maybe, depending on how quickly you can plug the Cat5 cables in. 
but same concept. We're taking all of the traffic on this inside interface and mirroring it over to the ASA and then processing the same scenario. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The um, couple other things that we need to get these done are there's a Cisco's criteria. Um, and they, you know, what, what they tell me is they'd like to see these actually prioritized to see what your main concerns are, the reason you're interested in, in looking at what's going on with your perimeter appliance currently. Um, I, they're, they're labeled yes and no. I think they were going to change it to, um, you know, listing them as a priority one through seven or whatever they are. So we need that to submit to Cisco, um, especially if we're having to get licensing um, for it. Uh, and in the last page, if you were, again, if you were sent this document, uh, would be something that has to be filled out. So network ranges, a lot of times, almost everyone's using a, a, like a 10 dot, uh, 192.168, So these are, we can actually just do an RFC 1918 policy, which is essentially just covers all the private IPS address spaces. That would be perfectly okay. Um, time zone, and then again, we're going to populate. Um, excuse me, IP address information, that mask, default gateway, DNS, stuff we already talked about. Um, and some questions here. If you have all those, it's great. If not, we can work it out when we install it. So that's that's kind of the document. I just wanted to touch on that. Um, and uh, this particular, this information in particular, especially if we're doing the ESXi on-site, we need all this information up front to get licensing, and we ask for two weeks from the time we get this to get everything built, get the licensing put together, and have it all ready to go for the customer. So something to keep in mind um, as far as being able to deliver on expectations. So, so I'm going to bring up a couple of examples. Um, of the reports that are generated um, to give you an idea of what those look like. And again, these are high level. Um, what I've, oops, I'm sorry about that. What I've found is, mm, in most cases, the technical person we're engaging with sees a lot more value in in the time we put in um, going through what Fireside Management Center is seeing and how to use that tool and how to diagnose what's going on. The value is there, but a lot of times these reports are for, say, upper management approval into maybe why they're justifying um, a new perimeter solution. So this is one of them. This is a uh, the network risk report. There's three of them, uh, network, malware, and attack. And it takes everything it's seeing and puts it into this nice summary. Um, again, tech guys are going to say, well, whatever, right? It's pretty, but um, there's not a lot of specifics. The specifics are in Fireside Management Center as we allow the use for that two weeks and help you go through it. But, so these reports are interesting, uh, definitely at a high level. They'll give you a quick look at all the traffic on your network, uh, applications, Client applications, web applications, things to pay attention to. If you have BitTorrent, Hydeman, um, Tors, things that you should probably make sure you're aware of that are going on in your network. Um, all the web browsers and, of course, all the vulnerabilities from old web browsers that are on your network. Uh, risky web browsing. Take a look at what everybody's doing on your network. Uh, applications, uh, operating systems. I'll actually go into that just a little bit here. Uh, and of course, the file policy, looking at all the files moving around on the network. So I'm not going to go through all three of them. Um, I just want to give you an idea of what the high level reports look like and what, what you'll see as a final deliverable from Serium on these. So hopefully that was somewhat useful in seeing what you'll get out of those. but. Um, so what I want to do is throw up right now the architecture.
So we'll put together one of these for um, each POV so we understand what's going on. Obviously, this one's been sanitized. <laughs> There's nothing particular in here that's going to help anybody. But So customer switch, um, mirror port or span port, depending on which piece of equipment drops into ASA. In this case, it's a 5506, but we have two flavors, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the source fire module inside the ASA it reports to Fireside Management Center. So usually when we set these up, um, really the only issues we've had is making sure that the, the port is open for this particular communication um, and the span is set up correctly. Other than that, they're, they're pretty simple to stand up. We haven't had a lot of issues with them. So those are the two major that come to mind. But um, hopefully this architecture makes sense. The source fire metadata is just a reference to being able to talk to the cloud and get what it needs. So um, I'll get back to this. The 5506, ASA 5506, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with um, the new X series. Um, the X series are the source fire or fire, fire power services devices. Uh, so we have two versions, 5506, and with these we are um, we're turning on everything. <laughs> so we get the licensing from Cisco, or we use again DCloud, where the licensing is is available to us, and we turn on URL filtering, AMP for networks, advanced malware protection, which is your file policies, um, application visibility and control, um, and next gen IPS. We turn on everything. So the the ASAs are going to take a hit on bandwidth, so we have to be careful when we size these. 5506 will do about 50 meg of throughput with everything turned on. Um, if we exceed that, then we start dropping logs, and it becomes a not so beneficial scenario for what we're trying to accomplish. So in that case, we use a 5525x, um, and usually we can do close to 300 meg. I think the technical specs about 250, but we do 300 meg on that with everything turned on. So we try and size it appropriately. Again, we need to have some interaction to understand what we're trying to get, what the requirements are for the network, and so we can size it appropriately and build it. So I want to actually take you through. Um, give me one second. Open the right window here. This is, um, I think, the ultimate goal here is just to give everyone visibility into their network and what their device may, current device may or may not be doing. And this is where you'll see everything. So this is where we'll do the, we'll stand it up and do the initial walkthrough. Is on. This is Firesight Management Center. Um, and then we'll do the 48-hour follow-up here, seeing if there's anything um, we need to make sure you're aware of. Uh, and then the one-way follow-up, we'll, we'll do in-depth in this tool. Um, so one of the things I wanted to make sure that I at least brought this up, this is the Context Explorer. It's kind of the summary of everything it's finding and, and what it's looking at. And what's interesting is, Uh, I guess I should qualify. <laughs> this this is a uh, Sirium's, so I'll have to be careful <laughs> where I go. But um, I want to throw this up here. It goes and learns the next gen IPS for SourceFire goes and learns all of the operating systems that it's seeing on the network, and it learns all of the web applications and client applications. And, and the reason it does that is it references those to CVEs to known vulnerabilities, so that when it has an event. It can say, you know what, we had an event happen. It was a, a Linux-based attack against the Windows operating system. So it can classify them and go from an impact level one down to an impact level four, which helps the security operations team prioritize their time because IPS and IDS can be really noisy. Um, so what SourceFire does is looks at all of those and does a contextual analysis and says, hey, here's an impact level one event. Someone needs to go look. At this, it's, it's fairly relevant and you need to pay attention. Um, and then it'll drop it down to two, three, and four. So, you know, the SecOps guys can prioritize their time. So, we'll get all of that visibility, or you will get all that visibility into your network. 
Um, and again, you'll look at all the applications, client applications, give it a second here, uh, and web applications. But the, this here, this Fireside Management Center is the tool that um, by far is the most interesting part. And again, most of the POVs we've done uh, to date, almost everything has been done here um, with the more technical folks. And this is really where the value is at. Um, and again, the reports are great, but getting two weeks to drive this and understand that, yes, there's a lot of knobs and buttons, but it's really pretty intuitive um, and, they're, and it's a really powerful tool. So all things to um, consider when we're doing these. Right, I want to pull up one more here. Uh, the other thing, hopefully I'm not bouncing around too much, the, the POV done with eCloud is, I would not say more powerful, but a lot more in depth in the fact that they've gone through and built custom dashboards specifically for the POV, um, the Source Fire team in Boston has. And so we have some looks and some different tables and, and dashboards available for ease of use um, for the customer trying to do the POV. But this is probably my favorite one to go look at. I, I don't even look at the context one usually. Um, but the summary dashboard tells me all about my network, what's going on, applications, client apps, operating system. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to not go too far into some of these because um, there's names associated with the places they're going, different things. But um, so traffic by initiator. And I want to pop up this screen. So this is what I was telling you. Here's your indications of compromise. So we can drill into those and take a look at them. Uh, we can click on the host and look at who the host is. Um, if you're integrated with LDAP, you can see who the user was that was on at a particular time, uh, everything about that host. Um, and here's the intrusion events I was talking about, the ability to do an analysis and see if the event or if the threat was relevant and how relevant was it. Um, so we don't have any impact ones in our network, which is good. Um, we have some impact twos, um, and overall we have 24 uh, in the last day. You can see up here on the right where we can change the view. Probably go look at one week, and I'm sure there's an impact in one in there somewhere. Nope, there isn't, which is good. So, okay. <laughs> Got distracted there. I apologize. Um, so again, customer interaction is very important for the architecture to size the ASA appropriately uh, and to get the network information to build it and get it stood up. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time working with the customer on this interface here, this Fireside Management Center, uh, and using it as a tool, generating reports, um, there's some really neat tools in here for generating reports. As a matter of fact, you know, you can dig into a particular area and right on the top it'll say, you know, report template. You can just click on that and it'll actually build a report for you based on what you're looking at. So there's a lot of things we can go um, do during this engagement that I think will be really helpful. So the other piece that I mentioned um, is the AMP for endpoint. And I, I guess I don't want to get two sides back into what AMP for endpoint is, but so AMP for network, which is here on this uh, Fireside Management Center, um, is for everything it sees traversing that north-south interface perimeter. And I, I don't want, again, I don't want to guess, I get two sidetracked, but so AMP for network takes, it's a really cool, policy that it says, or an uh, application. So as a file tries to enter the network, it'll say malware quarantined, um, uh, unknown or known good, which is, you know, not, most of the case not going to happen. But so everything it sees that it's unknown, it, it tracks it. It's, so they allow you into the network, but 
I'm going to follow you because I, I don't know who you are yet. And that's that retrospective piece that the source fire can bring to the table with AMP. Um, I'll just see if I can pull up one of these real quick, give you the visual. So we can see where the file entered the network from that IP address. Um, it then transferred to 31.12, and you can see it was disposition is malware. Um, so I don't know if I can find one real quick. I don't want to get too off track, but so it'll show it as unknown as it moves around the network, and then when it gets an update and says, you know what, we know that that's now malware. It was a zero day, but a week later, we know it's malware now. Um, it'll actually know how to go through and it'll quarantine those files. Now, the reason I got a little sidetracked here is to, to tie that into AMP for Endpoint. AMP for Endpoint has the visibility down at the host level in that east-west area. So even though the north-south, if, if a file comes into the network through your perimeter appliance, it'll see that file and be able to, to say a known, unknown, now or whatever, and tag it. But once it, if it doesn't traverse that interface ever again, it doesn't know where it may have moved east and west within the network. So Amphorn Point is a great tool because it sees all of the same definitions and runs about the same way. When a file comes in, if it's malware, obviously it quarantines it. Um, if it's not, it takes it as unknown. Um, but not only does it follow it where it goes, it follows everything it does. So that's called the device trajectory. So whether it tries to execute um, and gets quarantined, whether um, you know it did execute and didn't get quarantined, it put a dropper in your registry, it keeps track of everything it does and where it goes so that the machine can be remediated um, if it's updated as malware. It also gives it visibility into uh, like a host-based IDS scenario where it's looking at what it's doing, what it's trying to execute, is it suspicious, um, and it'll send all that up to Talos and ThreatGrid um, for analysis. So the AMP for endpoint piece um, gives us more visibility. So in these POVs, what we've done several times is, if you can picture it this way, um, put it into a network, um, the DNS is on the inside interface, all of the hosts are somewhere downstream of that. So if you have a bunch of hosts on your network making requests to say known malware sites, um, the only time that the POV is going to see, the only thing the POV is going to see is the request coming from the DNS to known malware sites. It doesn't see which host made that request to the DNS. Um, so in those cases, the, there's times we'll deploy the AMP for endpoint piece into some of the, the hosts that are suspicious anyway uh, and see if we can track it down. Um, the other piece of that, and architecture-wise, that we've talked about is you can put the DNS into a different inside interface, in which case uh, the request will have to traverse the ASA with source fire to get to that and back out. So then you'll have visibility. But that's probably not someone's going to do for a POV. So, but just food for thought. Um, so the AMP for endpoint piece will actually ties into this site management center uh, here on this AMP tab. And so when you get your overview, you will get indications of compromise that are coming from the AMP for endpoint piece. And AMP for endpoint works anywhere. Uh, if they're sitting at Starbucks, um, download malware, of course it'll quarantine if it knows. If not, if it sees weird behavior, you'll get IOCs here in this dashboard. So you'll have one pane of glass to look at to manage both your perimeter device um, and your AMP for endpoint pieces. So they would show up here in this indications of compromise piece. Uh, the other piece I wanted to touch on with AMP for endpoint is it it wasn't designed as an AV replacement. Because there's a lot of tools that, like SEP, has a lot more functionality than just AV. Um, but it can. You can deploy it uh, 
has both a malware piece and antivirus using um, Tetra AV or a Clam AV. So those are options when you deploy it. Um, but I just wanted to kind of clarify that it's not it wasn't designed as a replacement for. I mean it can as long as you're not using additional functions other than just as an AV. So hopefully I covered where we'd like to go with the proof of value. Hopefully it was informative and give you some insight into, into what we're trying to accomplish and what it doesn't do. Um, you know, it's not a security audit and stuff. We already talked about that. Um, it's been very compelling. Almost everyone we've done has found things where um, customers have asked to keep it longer because they're now have open tickets against some of those hosts and what's going on and they're asking to keep it a little longer to try and remedy that some of that because they can't just you know in the next day fire out a PO and get it stood up and, and address it that way so it's been very successful and very helpful for folks um, and in the amp for endpoint piece uh, additional tool that we use but it, it's a different proof of value if you want to do an entire block of that and just look at that piece um, as opposed to just the uh, amp, amp for network and source fire piece that we're talking about here so if there's any questions you can uh, contact your Sirium account executive um, they will definitely get me involved uh, we can get the documents out to you, whether they're um, sample reports or, um, you know, a reference architecture for it, uh, or even the Cisco Sirium uh, POV document, so we can get it filled out and get some of these going. So, hopefully, it was informative for everybody. And if you have any questions, like I said, contact your account executive, and they'll they'll probably get me involved. So, hopefully, you have a good day, and thanks for attending. <laughs>